I'm Mark Lodell, and I am a cell therapist. So that doesn't mean I'm the doctor in the cartoon here treating a cell. I use human tissues and cells to make tissue and cell medicines, to treat cancer, to treat immunodeficiencies, and as you're going to hear today, uh, to make tissue engineered products for regenerative medicine and transplantation. So these cell and tissue medicines are very promising. Uh, they're certainly very challenging, and I hope you'll get that feel from what I'm going to say in the next 15 minutes. And I think they're the ultimate patient-specific medicine, and they're going to be really transformative in medicine for the rest of this century and hopefully beyond. I'm interested in all sorts of, of cell and tissue medicines, um, but today we're talking about tissue-engineered products uh, and ultimately organs. So if we think about these, these, these regenerative medicines, there are just simple progenitor cells. Um, and you can go and be treated now. There's a licensed medicine in Europe uh, for repairing um, uh, uh, tendons um, using chondrocytes. This was a child um, who had been born now 15 years ago with what's called tracheal atresia. So if you pardon me, I'll just point out. Oh, it won't show. OK. So if you look at the uh, image on the right-hand side where the circle is, his trachea had now... He'd been born with a trachea that was uh, one... 0.8 millimetres in diameter. It should have been 11 millimetres in diameter. So at that point, he really couldn't breathe. And uh, shortly after birth, he had a stent put in, one of these wire baskets that you're probably familiar with for, for, for paper, people who have a, a myocardial infarct, a heart, heart attack. You open that, that closed artery with a stent. Well, his airway was open with a stent. And as he got bigger and a little bit older, more of these had to be put in. But it never fully opened his airway. And you can see here, even at the age of 10... Um, this airway here is considerably restricted. So he couldn't play football, he couldn't go out with the boys, in fact, he couldn't walk more than uh, a few metres without resting. Ultimately, at the age of 10, one of those stents unwound, it ripped through the back of his uh, windpipe and opened up uh, or burst his uh, major blood vessels. So he had some emergency surgery and then he was sent back to Great Ormond Street where colleagues of mine looked at him and said, could we make him a new bit of trachea? So this is a donor trachea from a, a, a cadaveric organ donor. Um, and what we did, after various um, chemical treatments, we turned it into that white, mushy thing at the bottom, which is basically all of the basket that is your trachea, but with all the cells stripped out. And then you can see the surface of it is, is um, not... Well, you have to take my word for it, but it's not too dissimilar from a, a cellularized surface. And you can see there are no cells within that, se that section through the trachea. So if you're going to use one of these scaffolds, what do you have to do? Well, first off, to prevent rejection, as you heard earlier on, you've got to remove the donor cells. So on the right-hand side, left-hand side there, you can see um, the brown stain there is the, are the molecules on the surface that your immune system would see and would reject. And the blue dots are the nuclei of the cells in the scaffold. And you can see in the image to the right of that that after we've treated it, um, none of the cells are there. There are no blue dots and the brown stain has gone. In other words, there are no, uh, none of the proteins that the immune system would recognise. And in fact, we can prove that. Colleagues of mine stitched it into a, a rat, and it wasn't rejected by the rat. <coughs> so even a, a cross-species barrier, there wasn't an immune response. So we can show that we can make it non-immunogenic. But the critical thing about these, these scaffolds is they have to give the right signals to the cells for the cells to live. And there's a cartoon there on the bottom showing how complex that is with collagen fibres, fibronectin, and uh, carbohydrates and, uh, and uh, proteins and complex polysaccharides. And once you've got all of that extracellular matrix there giving the right signals to the cell, you also have to have the right biocompatible stiffness, if you like, of this structure because cells actually have a way of detecting the bio biomechanics of the surface they're on. And we don't understand that yet. It's one of our challenges. But if you look at the images on the, the right here, this is a muscle fibre. And muscle fibres, to work, have to have these striations. And if you put it onto a surface that doesn't have enough stiffness, it doesn't striate. So we have to get this right for all of the structures that we make. And that's a big challenge. So we've got the scaffold. Then we've got to get the cells. And, and these are cells, uh, these are mesenchymal stem cells from a bone marrow growing on the left-hand side here in a Petri dish, just, just or a flask, we're looking at another microscope. This is a completely alien uh, environment for these cells. What you ultimately want them to do is to, to grow onto your scaffold, integrate, and become the right sort of cell. And here we have, 
on the right-hand side here, one of those mesenchymal cells sti stuck to uh, one of our decellularized scaffolds, and you can see how it's integrating and sending out these pseudopodia, which are attaching to the scaffold and getting back those signals from those extracellular matrix molecules that are so complex, and also getting that feel, if you like, uh, for how stiff the scaffold is and what it should do. And some of them round up and others flatten out. What that means, we're still trying to understand. But we can get these cells into scaffolds and we can make them do what they're meant to do. Then the other thing we need to do to, to make this work is, is create bioreactors. So I, as a biologist and a biological scientist, have to work with engineers uh, and, sadly, also with surgeons. Um, <coughs> Surgeons are just engineers who don't know they're engineers, really. Um, <laughs> so we design these bioreactors, anything from something quite so Heath Robinson as the... the in fact, that's probably an insult to Heath Robinson on the left-hand side there where we're decellularizing a structure by pumping decellularizing agents through it uh, to something really sophisticated like this Bose equipment in the middle there where we're changing the tensile strength of that scaffold while we're cellularizing so we can change the stiffness and see what effect that has. Um, and anybody who spends £60,000 on one of those will be hugely disappointed to know that they don't come with a set of headphones at the same time. <laughs> <coughs> this is actually the bioreactor we use for that scaffold we put in, into young Kieran, uh, and this is its, its now modern sister that we're using for making uh, voice boxes. And ultimately, if you get it all right, it looks something like that, and it's no longer flobby and flappy and white and horrible. It's looking a bit more pink and a bit stiffer, and it can be transplanted or implanted uh, into uh, the patient. And this is, is that young boy having his piece of uh, windpipe replaced. So what could we do? Well, I think five is probably over-cautious. I think be, be, before five years, we will be in a situation where we can take a liver, this is a, a liver um, lobe um, from a transplant recipient at the Royal Free, and this is from some of my colleagues at the Royal Free who've then decellularized it. So they've taken all the cells I like we do with that scaffold, that trachea scaffold. The parenchyma's there, all the vessels are there, but it's got no cells in it. So here we have lifelong immunosuppression or no immunosuppression. It's got to be better, hasn't it? However, this is a transplant organ. This is a drug. It's a medicine because you've substantially modified it. It has to be regulated under all of the same laws as any other pharmaceutical product that you go and buy or get prescribed. So what does that do to the field? Well, if we look at transplant organs, they've been around since the 60s. And as we all know, everywhere in the world, it's philanthropic donation. I gladly gave my brother's organs uh, to benefit somebody else or several other people. It's mostly around the world, a public sector supply chain with very limited regulation. There's never been a proof of concept. It is self-evident they work, isn't it? There's no proof of efficacy. And there's lifelong immunosuppression. In contrast, this is regulated as a medicine. Okay? It's very complex and expensive to manufacture, and you need formal clinical trials to prove that it works, and those are very expensive. We hear often it's a billion dollars to take a drug through market. But it doesn't require a lifelong immunosuppression, all of this, the, the side effects that come with that. But I think in order to meet the top three, you need a, 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 pr a private sector supply. They have to be supplied for profit because of the cost and the complexity. What does that do to philanthropic donation? Would I have been willing to give my brother's liver to a company to turn it into a drug and sell it to a profit? Well, yes, I would. But those, are, those questions need to be asked, and we need to be asking ourselves these questions now, ready for when uh, the, the industry and the pharmaceutical uh, uh, setup is there to deliver these. It also doesn't really fit with the World Health Organization guiding principles on transplantation, which is that they must not be done for a sort of financial gain. And this is a, a global um, guiding principle. So we do have to start thinking about these, and we have to start thinking about them urgently, because these cell drugs are around the corner. But more importantly, this actually doesn't address the shortage of organ donors, because you still end up with one liver and one recipient. So perhaps the way around that is to stop using organ donor scaffolds from human donors. This is a, a pig heart valve, and 
thousands of these are implanted into patients around the world every year. So why couldn't we use porcine tissues? And this indeed, this, here's that Heath Robinson bioreactor, and the reason I show it to you again is because that's a pig trachea being decellularized in that bioreactor, um, rather than uh, a human trachea. Now, we're not in a position yet to put those into patients, but I'm sure it won't be far around the corner. This actually is um, the reverse. This is a pig larynx, so a voice box, into which we've put a human piece of tissue, that piece of tissue in the middle there. And this is replicating the damage that occurs in patients who've had laryngeal cancer, and the cancer has been treated, and they, they end up with a piece of, of dead tissue, which granulose, granuloma forms, and it ultimately impinges on the voice box. And so we're starting a clinical trial uh, next month, the first patient we treated, where we'll put um, a human uh, piece of tissue into, cellulized with the patient's own cells into that defect. What we did here was put it into the pigs to prove that it could be surgically done, but this was, it was an immunosuppressed pig. We put a human tissue with human cells into a pig uh, to show it could be done, and we actually did, did 16 pigs successfully. So if you look inside, if you do a bronchoscope on that pig, what you can see is that um, the, the tissue has integrated perfectly. So I think you might be able to see just a slightly pale patch on the left-hand side there. That's the human uh, tissue engrafted uh, into the pig and causing a functional um, uh, wound repair. So the other problem we have, amongst many, is how do we seed the cells into those scaffolds? And this is a, a glass bioreactor on the top there. Um, a friend of my, one of my colleagues, Colin, this is a, a piece of trachea being recellularized, and beneath it, you can see an image of the cells going into that, uh, being, being pumped into that trachea and cellularizing it. And the, the bright green is where there are the most cells, the blue is where there are fewer cells. You can see that the top one there is, is at um, four hours. A day later, most of those cells have either died or gone, and by seven days, they've gone altogether. So getting the cells to go to the right place and stay there proliferate, differentiate, do all the things you want them to do is actually still a big challenge. So here we have some images from a colleague of mine, uh, Luca Rabadi, at uh, Great Ormond Street. And here he's used an injecting system to inject cells into the scaffold, micro-injection. <clears throat> the cells go into the tissue, they stay in the tissue, but they don't migrate through the tissue. Taking it one step further, he's used the same micro-injection technique, but mixed two different cell types. And by doing that, you can now see that they have uniformly spread throughout the tissue. The cells have interacted and led to a, a biological phenomenon whereby they migrate into the whole tissue. And we're using this now uh, to work to towards producing uh, a working esophagus for children who are born with esophageal atresia. But one of my great enthusiasms about this field is that you should be able to think laterally. You know, this idea of working with engineers, surgeons, physiotherapists, physiologists is actually very exciting. So getting something uniformly and reproducibly into a fixed depth of human tissue has been done for centuries. We call it tattoos. So we have a big hairy tattooist joining my group next week. Um, <laughs> Uh, and that's not, no, he's big and he's hairy. Um, and he's going to teach us how to tattoo skin. We're going to then use that to tattoo esophagus, and then we're going to use it to tattoo cells into esophagus. And if it works, it will radically move us forward. But we have to think that little bit beyond where we are already. Okay? It did actually cause a bit of a problem in the university saying, I need to put a salary line on uh, for a tattooist. <laughs> It's worse, I have sent one of my staff to order um, four boxes of condoms in the past. Um, <laughs> <coughs> yeah, actually to inflate the inside of, a, of, a, of a, uh, an organ. So one of the questions is, do these things work? Okay, um, so this is actually is the oldest recording I can find, and I have to thank uh, an old student of mine um, who I found this, but this is a, a, an Irish uh, folklore, the Tain Bo Quilage, whatever, however, uh, in which there is the story of Cithern, who was a warrior uh, who was mortally wounded in battle and treated by the, the healer Fingen by bathing him in bone marrow uh, for three days. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it, but apparently um, Cithern recovered, and it's the first documented 
um, uh, treatment of a regenerative medicine. Um, now, I'm not necessarily suggesting that you take my word that that is the only proof of regenerative medicines working. This is quite a lovely story, and many of you may have seen the film um, of Dream Alliance, um, the story of the racehorse. And I won't go into that. I don't have time, and it's not relevant. But what is relevant is that Dream Alliance was a racehorse who had an injury tearing a ligament. And the course vet said, this horse cannot recover. We have to put him down on the course. And the family that were involved in training this horse said, no, we're going to take him home. And they spent all of the money that this horse had won in prizes to try an experimental treatment whereby they took stem cells from the horse and used them to repair the, the, um, uh, the collagen defect uh, in, in his hind leg. Uh, and he then went on to win, win the, the Welsh National. So good animal proof that these tissues work. Um, can we do another? That's it. Now, I showed you earlier on, the pig um, <coughs> showing the integration. Well, the question is, did it actually work? Could the pigs squeak afterwards? So if we can start the first one. This was the pig before <coughs> surgery. Okay. This is the pig five weeks after surgery with a human. <laughs> okay? So I'll agree that he's a bit more croaky, but then I think if you'd had your larynx ripped open and sewed back together again, so would you. Um, what I didn't show you was the sheer joy of watching a, a research technician trying to get that pig to grunt to camera. To, 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 to. Pig nuts is the secret. Okay. So, can we have the next slide, please? Okay. So, it works in, in horses, it works in pigs. What about humans? Well, that... Um, the young boy I started with, Kieran, um, lots of people criticised us and said, you don't know enough about the science, you haven't proven this in 15,000 monkeys, you haven't done this, you shouldn't put this into patients. Well, Kieran was dying, um, and very bravely, his parents and Kieran put themselves up for this, this real first in man. He was the first child in the world to receive a, a, a tissue-engineered organ made from his own uh, cells, and stem cells. And so that was him before surgery, this is him after surgery, and you can see with our piece of tissue in there between the two stars, he has a perfectly patent airway. Can we play that? Okay, and this is on Irish television um, only a year or so ago. He's become a bit of a star. <laughs> He's met the Pope, and he plays football. In fact, a year after a surgery, he sent us all a text message saying, I'm a much better footballer now. So, yes, these things work. But there's still a, lot, lot, a long way to go. And it's people like Kieran and it's people like his parents um, that make that happen because they're brave enough to let us try these things. And my colleagues are brave enough to do it and clever enough to tell us how to do it. So thanks to all of them, and thank you for listening.